Welcome to an enlightening podcast from IslamPodcasts.com. We encourage our listeners to please comment and let us know how we can grow in our knowledge to better serve our community. Please remind your family and friends to also visit IslamPodcasts.com for engaging discussions on current events, Islamic guidance, Quran, Tafsir, Sira, and much more. Welcome to an enlightening podcast from IslamPodcasts.com. We encourage our listeners to please comment and let us know how we can grow in our knowledge to better serve our community. Please remind your family and friends to also visit IslamPodcasts.com for engaging discussions on current events, Islamic guidance, Quran, Tafsir, Sira, and much more. Alhamdulillah. والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي It's an interesting topic uh, that I'd like to talk about today which is Muslim families cultivating confident youth and uh, when we're talking about cultivating the confident youth obviously we're talking about the families who will be cultivated and if there are youth Inshallah, they will be learning many lessons, inshallah, from the talk that will be my intent. So, alhamdulillah, that we have gathered here, that itself is a sign that the families that we have here, they would like to participate in these kind of events even on a Sunday night. Many of us would have been doing many other things, but we decided to be here because we understand an obligation from Allah Azza wa Jal to protect ourselves and our families from the fire. This is, this is the sole reason that we have all gathered here. We understand as Muslims and Muslim Ummah that this, this is our responsibility to live the way of life that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has ordained on us. It's an obligation on us. It is not a recommendation that live according to Islam when we feel like it. And whenever we can bend the rules and look for some other ways other than what Allah has commanded. Rather, it is an obligation on all of us, every single one of us, to live the life as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained to us. We call ourselves Muslims, which itself bears the burden that we submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just by the name we know. We are the ones who submit our will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever we want to do, we know we have to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. So inshallah, today's talk will cover, encompass how to be a non-apologetic Muslim and not only a non-apologetic Muslim, but also a confident Muslim. I took the word youth out even though it's part of the title. But for us to cultivate the Muslim youth as confident, we have to be confident. We have to be confident in Islam. So what we're carrying, are we really confident? Are we the one? Are we the ones who like to declare no matter where we are at, that Alhamdulillah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us Muslims. Whether we had to make a choice at one point in our lives, or we were born in Muslim families, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the tawfiq to be on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and live the life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. So we are here, why? Because Allah azza wa jal says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِكُمْ نَارًا Who you who believe? Protect yourself and your families from the fire. وَقُوْدُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ The insan or the human beings, mankind, the people, and the stones are the fuel of the hellfire. That fire we are talking about. This is the fire we want to protect ourselves from. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues on about this fact 
by saying alayha malaikatun ghiladun shidad Allah has placed severe tough angels on top of this fire la ya'asun Allah ma amaruhum they do not disobey to the commands Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to them wa yaf'aluna ma yu'maruna and they do what Allah has commanded them to there will not be no bribery over there or get away from the hellfire just because you belong to a certain family or you, you accumulate a certain amount of wealth and on and on and on. It will be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Maliki Yawmiddin. He is the one who will make the decision. Nobody will have a right to speak except the one who was given the right by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The brother he just recited Surah Rahman. When he was reciting, well, the first thing came to my mind was Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anh, his story. While the Muslims were in Mecca and they were going through severe kinds of hardships in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they were going through torture, physical, mental, psychological, name it. And Sahaba were sitting and talking to each other and somebody said, nobody has recited the Quran in the Haram yet. Is there anyone who can do that? And Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he said he will do it. And Sahaba, the best of the generation, they said, no, you should not go. You are from a tribe which is weak and you yourself is a weak person. To the point, some people, they used to make fun of the legs of Abdullah bin Mas'ud. The skinny legs. This person, he says he will do it. He went to the haram. He started reciting Ar Rahman, Allah al Quran. MashaAllah, very beautiful recited by the Shaykh here. And even if you understand Arabic or we don't understand Arabic, it sounds very pleasing. And he's reciting in the language not only Abdullah bin Mas'ud understands, but the Kuffar of the Makkah understands well. Because it was revealed in their language. And he started reciting, they start beating him up. They started beating him up. And then Abdullah bin Mas'ud comes back to the Sahaba. And the Sahaba said, we warn you. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud's response was what? I will go to again tomorrow. That's not a problem. What made Abdullah bin Mas'ud so confident to recite the Quran, even if it meant to take it, his life to be lost because of this cause? What made, him what made him so confident? What made him so firm on the deen of Allah Ta'ala? There was not enough Quran was there yet. The Quran was not revealed enough yet. Very small amount of Quran was revealed in Mecca and Era. And we know many of those surahs are very small surahs. They're not even long surahs there. And Abdullah bin Mas'ud, whatever Quran was there, there was enough for him to be motivated to be firm on the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now what I would like to understand, inshallah, in the rest of the talk, what made Abdullah bin Mas'ud the way he was at that time? And not only him, but the other Sahaba as well. There were many Sahaba who never saw the whole Quran, who gave their lives for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of the Sahaba, they never saw a mushaf of the Quran. Nowadays, many of us, I see, they're hanging the mushaf in the rear mirror of the cars, the small ones. Or they have many, many more masahib at home. Unfortunately, many of us don't even go back and read it. Was, what does that mushaf say? What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? So what is it? What is in this book from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that impacted them? That impacted them that we can still feel the resonance the vibration, the impact that they created until today, those Sahaba. That's the idea of building, cultivating the confident Muslim Ummah as a whole. That's what we like to see. That's what we like to see in ourselves and in the future generation, inshallah. And inshallah, to do so, we would like to go over, I'd like to go over some of the examples first and then elaborate on that. As I said, the Quran that impacted the Sahaba so much, how come it's not impacting us? Let's look at the example in the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were kuffar of the Mecca 
who were well aware that the revelation Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is getting, it is from Allah. They were aware of it. That's not a problem that they, they were not aware of it. Like Abu Jahal bin Ibn Hisham, Ahnas bin Shurayb, Abu Sufyan bin Ha. These were leaders of the Quraysh. They used to visit Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam while he was reciting the Quran during the night time when he was still in Mecca and Iraq, in the Mecca. They would go during the night time. None of them know, none of them knew about each other that they were hiding and listening to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the first night they went on the way back. During the daytime, they bumped into each other. They said, they were, this is not right. We are the leaders, and we are impressed by this book. Then what's going to happen to the regular ones? They promised to each other, let's not do it again. Next day, next day, same thing happens. Same thing, three people, same three, they bump into each other. And then the third day. Then they realize, we really have to do something about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's going to take over. We better do something to stop Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they gathered and they were talking at one point when Hamza radiallahu anh, Umar bin Khattab, they became Muslim. Now that's a big thing for them. These are big guys within Makkan, with the Makkans and they have to do something now. So they were sitting and deciding what should we do? They said Utbah bin Rabia radiallahu anh, Rabia ma'atullah alayh. And he said he's going to go talk to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and discuss with him, let's calm him down. And he started offering him some sort of compromises that Rasulullah sallallahu make. So don't do what you're doing, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, okay, you have said what you had to say. And then now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he started reciting Surah Al-Fusil. And he said, Ha'ameen, Tanzilun min ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. كتاب فصلت آياته قرآن عربي لقوم يعلمون. They understand this language. It was in their language until Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم got to the point where he said فإن عاد فقل أنذرتكم صعيقة صعيقة مثل صعيقة عاد وثمود. He's warning them about the صعيقة, the punishment that descended on the nation of هود عليه السلام and صالح عليه السلام. Because it was in the, his language, he understood what Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was saying to the point, he put his hand on the mouth of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because he felt as if this punishment is about to descend on Meccans now. They were aware of Aad and Thamud, the nations of Aad and Thamud. So he was afraid that very same punishment is going to come down to them. He was shocked. Now he went back to the rest of the leaders of the Meccans. And he is, was trying to convince them, leave him alone. Leave him alone. They, they realized this Uqba, the one who went to talk to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not the same when he came back. He was impacted by the very same verses of the Quran. And now, when he went back and he started talking to them, they're telling them, leave Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to his, whatever he's doing, let him do. Because if he's successful, we are part of him. But if he gets angry and the, and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down to them, they will be doomed. Of course, the Tufar of the Makkah, they started like killing him. And at that point, he left it as is. And he did not accept Islam. Even though he was impacted. Even though Abu Jahl was impacted. Even though Akhnas bin Shuraik was impacted. Even though Sufyan, uh, I mean, Abu Sufyan bin Harb was impacted. But they did not accept at that time. Abu Sufyan became Muslim later on, of course. The very same Quran at that time impacted Umar al Khattab in a different way. Umar al-Khattar about whom? Because about whom they used to think of him as a very harsh person before Islam. And they, never, they thought of him that he would not become a Muslim. And he used to punish the ones who became Muslim or whichever one he had the control over. And Umar Abdullah bint Hantama, anha, she was traveling and trying to migrate to Habasha during those days. And she came across Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anh. And Umar asked, where are you going? And she said basically that you guys have not made us live according to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we would like to do. We're leaving this land. And Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anh, even though he was so harsh and all that, he says, may Allah accompany you. 
And uh, Umm Abdullah, she felt something in Umar at that time. And she told Amr ibn Rabi'ah, when he came, that this is what happened. Umar was very, he seemed like there is some softness in Umar. And Amr said, it feels like you think Umar is becoming soft towards Islam. He said, لا يسلم حتى يسلم حمار الخطاب. He said, he will not accept Islam until the donkey of Fattah, the father of Umar, Umar, the donkey will accept Islam, then Umar might may accept it. Meaning, this is impossible we're talking about. The very same Umar Fattah, when he was excited by the Kuffar, the Mecca, to stop Muhammad Sallallahu he was on his way to kill Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when he found out by one of the Sahabi on his way, Mu'ayyim bin Abdullah, that his own sister, because he wanted to divert Umar al-Khattab, because he found out he's going to kill Rasulullah So he said, go take care of your own family first, your own sister, and your brother-in-law, they have become Muslim. Fatima bin al-Khattab. So he changed his path. Now he's towards his sister's house. Over there, he enters at a time when they were learning Quran, Surah al -Tahu. And he knocked at the door, Umar entered, the Sahabi who was teaching them, he hid in the, uh, behind the curtain or something. When he entered, he started, started, started asking about if they have become Muslim. And he started beating up his own brother-in-law. So the sister Fatima, she intervened. She tried to pull Omar away. And Omar pushed her away to the point that she fell and she started bleeding. When he saw his own sister bleeding, at that point, he came into his senses. He calmed down a bit. He wanted to talk now. He said, okay. Let me see what you guys were reading. Omar was one of those people, by the way, in those times when people were illiterate in the Arab. He knew how to read and write. He said, give me those papers, whatever you were reading, let me read. And his sister was smart. She wanted to calm him down. So she said, you are legis. Go to the ablution, wash up, then come. So she's calming him down. When he comes back, she gave, she gave him those uh, parchments that had Surah Taha on it. The Sitaha man zalla aika Quran al Dashqa illa ta zikira ta liman yaksha and on and on and on. As Omar is reading, the Quran, the, the, the Quran started impacting him. There was, an, was another incident. I'm not going to go all the details, of course. We will be discussing other things also. But this impacted him to the point right away he becomes a Muslim. How? He said, okay, where is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The person who was on his way to kill Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is looking for him so he can enter into politics. He goes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, accepts Islam, and not only that, and he said, we are, are we on hut? He said, yes. Then he said, why are we hiding? Let's go out. And Hamza radiallahu anhu, who became Muslim three days before one of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam takes all the Sahaba with two, two rows. One led by Umar, other led by Hamza. And now they are doing the tawaf of the Kaaba and reciting the Quran there. He has just become a Muslim and he is confident enough to face the kuffar. And some of the reports talk about that. Not only became Muslim like that, now he started going door to door and telling them I'm become, I have become Muslim. His own uncle Abu Jahl, how he went. And then uh, finally, when it was not enough and people were not responding to him as he was expected them to be responding, to be harsh with him. So he went to Jameer, one of the guys who was famous to be a CNN of that time, Fox News of that time. He started screaming from the top of his lung that Omar has become a Sabi. He has rejected his deen. Omar said, no, 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 no. I have not become a Sabi. I'm not the one who rejected anything. I have entered the post of Islam. I have become a Muslim. So that's what Omar was just by listening to parts of the Quran. And today we have brothers and sisters, the whole Quran in front of us. And we recite it on a daily basis. We listen to it on a daily basis. Where is the impact now? How come the Quran is not making us confident to the point we don't care about anybody, what they think about us? We do not care about the accusations of the accusers about the Muslim, towards the Muslim. What is it that is missing? That is what, inshallah, I will try to cover in the next few minutes of what I have. So if you want to build confident Muslims, let's talk about what do we mean by confident, when we say confident. 
confident is, if you go to the English dictionary and just look for the word confident, it means the person who is sure of oneself. He's sure. He's certain of what he's doing or saying. He is excessively bold. He doesn't care about what the others think about what he or she is doing. That's what it means by confident. But it's at any confident. A confident can be a Catholic, can be a Muslim, can be a secular, can be what, what, whatever you want to call it. But now when we talk about a Muslim to be confident, we're talking about his Islam. He is confident to be a Muslim. How do I make a Muslim to be confident about what he is carrying? First, we have to know who we are. Who, we, who are we? What, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has referred to us as? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِتَكُونُ شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that we have made you the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the just Ummah, the best Ummah it doesn't mean moderate Ummah I would like to reiterate over and over to the, to the brothers and sisters unfortunately many translations out there try to translate as Wasata means some mediocre or middle Ummah or balance is a different meaning that's why I said the just. But the balance is coming from where? Coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are balanced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are the best ummah. By the way, the word busata in Arabi language itself means best as well. It does not mean just middle. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us the best ummah and we are, we are witnesses over mankind. We are accountable for the mankind. We are the ones supposed to carry this message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to them. So Allah was witness over us. He, there is no doubt in anybody's heart that Muhammad conveyed the message in the best possible manner anyone can do. He did his job. He did his job to be the shaheed over us, the witness over us. Have we, are we doing the job of us? So understand that we are the best ummah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said other places, You are the best ummah raised for the mankind. This is the attitude a Muslim must carry because we are carrying the message from the creator of the heavens and the earth. How can we not have this attitude? How can we not be confident to carry this message when we have the message from the creator of the heavens and the earth? We are not talking about 10 people, 50 people, 100 people, or the whole world, mankind is gathered together and came up with a system of life. We are talking about a system of life that we have from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can we be not confident? Only reason can be if we do not understand this message properly. This is why it's very important to understand this message. Then we understand what does it mean by in the deen of Allah Islam, because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only deen is the deen of Islam. And the only deen acceptable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the deen of Islam. Do they seek other than the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are they seeking that? Worshipping none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while to him submitted all creatures in the heavens and the earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Anyone who, have, who is whoever seeks a religion other than Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept it. That's the attitude we have to have first. Now some brothers will come up and say, Brother, why are you talking like this? We are living in the West. How can you talk about that you are the best nation raised while you migrate from other countries to this country to get the goodies of this country? How can you talk like that? We can talk like that because this whole world belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only that, when we want to carry this message, this is not only for my sake that I like to say I, this ummah is better than the others. It's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said so. And we like to give this message of guidance to the whole mankind. We like to share the goodness Allah has given to us. How can we be the one who like to goodies from the others, but you have the best thing a mankind have, and you hide it in your back pocket? And that can only happen if we are not confident in that. If I am confident that this is the message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no way it can stop me to carry this message to the people. Now, so how do we cultivate this mentality? That's the question that comes to us. A couple of ayat, and then I will go into some detail on that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, 
يا أيها الذين آمنوا ادخلوا في السلم كافة ولا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان إنه لكم عدو مبين Oh, you will believe. And uh, I have mentioned this before la- last time I, I was here. Remember that whenever you would hear the ayat like this, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. We as Muslims should be acting the same way as Sahaba used to think. If this, these words have been said, okay, we, our ears should go up. Okay, Allah is going to give us some awamir or nawahi, meaning some commands to be done or something to be stayed away from. So here what Allah is saying, Enter into fold of Islam completely. Don't be the one who's entering part of Islam. Other part is too tough, too difficult. Let's not talk about it. Or let's try to change it. So people will be happy around me. The messengers were not sent to this world to distort the message that they were given. According to the realities they were sent in. They came... So they can change the reality according to the message Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So don't, don't get confused by that. That the message of Islam sometimes doesn't seem to be fitting. Yes, fine, it may not be fitting because we are in the reality that is ruled by the kufr. It will only make more sense when you make Allah above all. When we say, ala, Glorify the Rabb who is ala. Who's above all? Al-A'la. It's not like he's above this person, but not that person. Or this creation, but not that creation. No, he's above all. There's nothing even equal to him. And that's the way we should take Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not the way that some of the kuffar in the past did. And shaitan wants us to take the deen that way. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَا جَزَاءُ مَنْ يَفْعَلُ ذَلِكَ إِلَّا خِزْيٌ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ يُرُدُّونَ إِلَىٰ أَشَدِّ الْعَذَابِ Are you the one who take part of the book and reject the other part? Then you will have humiliation in this dunya and there will be severe punishment on the day of judgment. So if we want the success, real success in this dunya and akhirah, then we have to take the whole Islam as a whole, not parts and bits. Parts and bits will not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, we will have shortcomings as human beings. That's not what I'm talking about. Shortcomings are acceptable as long as they are exceptions to the case. The norm is we want to follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we don't do that, Allah has given us the warning. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amun. Man yartadda ankum, ma yartadda minkum an dinihi, fa sawfa yakti Allahu. Allah is saying, if you reject this book, or you who believe, if you reject this deen, Allah will replace you. Allah will replace you with other nations. Allah does not need us. We are the one who need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will replace us with who? Allah is giving us the attributes of those people, the characteristics of those people. They love Allah and Allah. And when we say love Allah, it means they follow whatever Allah is commanded to them. That's what I mean by loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are humble with the believers. And they are firm with the disbelievers. They fight in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they do not care about different kinds of accusations people make about them. Whatever names they call the Muslims with today, they don't care about that. That should not be the care for us. The care should be for us. Are we doing what Allah wants from us? That's the one, that one thing that we should be concerned about. So if we're trying to make those personalities, those confident Muslims, so we have to know what is an Islamic personality first. An Islamic personality or any kind of personality we're looking to, they're made of two factors. One is, how do you think, how, what is your b- basis your aqidah, your creed, that tells you what is right and what is wrong. The aqidah of la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah is the source of telling us what we should be doing and what we should be abstaining from. That's the source for us. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Once we enter into full Islam by saying these shahadatain, after that we submit to the will of Allah whatever Allah wants, 
way to look. As long as we confirm that this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, second part of the personality is it's not just you we believe, it's always connected to Amr Salihat. Do we act accordingly or not? So it's the aqliya part of it that La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, that all the rights and wrong comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who has given me the way of life that deals with everything. It's starting from even as basic things as how to enter into the bathroom and washroom. You step in with the left foot, exit from the right foot. You enter into the masjid with the right foot, exit from the left foot. Or talking about any kind of relationships we have, whether are talking about ibadah, mu'amalat, meaning so, well, how we worship, how we take care of the uh, rest of our lives, the transactions, and how we dress, how we eat, and all those things as well. So that's the action. These are the actions. So first, we have to know what Allah wants. Second, it has to be translated into action. A person cannot can ha- only have an Islamic personality. So before we get into the confident Muslim, we have to know what Islamic personality is. Our Islamic personality would be when a person, he thinks according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. Meaning, our thinking about what is right to do and what is wrong to do comes from Islam. And then our actions, the results from that are according to Islam as well. That will make a comprehensive Islamic personality. Does that mean if a person has a strong aqidah and now he is acting according to Islam, now he has become an angel and they will not make a mistake? No. There can be lapses. People can make mistakes. That's not the problem. People make mistakes. In the time of Rasulullah even the Sahaba made mistakes. Even those Sahaba, some of them, who participated in Badr made mistakes. About whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that about the, given, given the bad timing of them entering into Jannah. Even they made mistakes. Mistakes can be done by the humans. But those mistakes should not be a norm. This is an exception to the case. These are outliers. You must make mistakes, but they return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that will make Islamic personality. But if a person, he is a very, really wants to do something according to Islam, but he doesn't know what Allah wants, he doesn't have know the rulings of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants in the action, with a good intention, he'll be doing wrong things. He may start ending up fasting on the day of the Eid. Because he thinks he is doing something good. Fasting is good. No matter what day it is, he starts fasting. Because he does not have the knowledge, he may end up like that. Because he does not have the knowledge, he may be praying at the time when the sun is rising or sun is setting. Or at the time when it's on the peak. The time that which are not recommended to be praying. A sister who does not know the rules, why she is going through the period of time where she is not supposed to be praying, she may be praying. So things like that. So knowledge is important. You cannot be just very a spiritual being without knowing what Allah wants, and vice versa. You cannot be the alim, a mushtahid, the one who knows us about Islam, but when it comes to the actions, he's giving fatawa the quality to whoever well, gives more money. He becomes a scholar for dollar scholar, or just to please the people around him, giving fatawas, making riba halal for the people making mixed gathering halal for the people so people will be happy around him and on and on and on so it's not one or the other meaning it's not the, the, the intellectual part or it's not only the spiritual part of acting according to command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. it's both have to be according to Allah so that's what will create our Islamic personality so we want to convince ourselves first do we believe that this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we want to worship, do we really believe He is the creator of heaven and earth and everything around us? He is really the creator. And the book that Allah has given us, really the book of Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And Muhammad was the messenger. Do we really believe in those things? Once we have this ras of aqeedah, this aqeedah firmly installed in us, as we saw in the, in the case of Umar al-Khattar radiallahu anh, just listening to a few ayat were enough because that was concluded in his mind that this is it. Sometimes we procrastinate all the time. Oh yeah, inshallah, let's start acting going to Islam one day. Even to the point people do not, some of the unfortunate Muslims do not pray. You ask them to come and pray, they say, yeah, brother, go ahead, inshallah, I'll join you. 
And they'll throw up. The brother who are involved in the haram activity, you ask them not to do it. They'll say, yeah, I know it's haram, but continue on. What is it that's not preventing us to get away from this normal way of committing haram? Normally continuously committing haram. What is it prevent, not preventing us? That is, we really have to question ourselves. Do we understand that we can die at any time and we have to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There is no guarantee we have that we are going to breathe the second, the second breath that I'm, I'm taking or I'm, I'm exhaling. Do I have the guarantee? No. So any one of us can die at any time. Have we prepared ourselves to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's the way we should look at the life. That's the way this Islamic personality should be. That's the way that, that will make a person confident once he understands that he is going to respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has to answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we understand the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in this context. When the hadith says, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يكون هواه طبعا لما جئت به. This hadith is reported by Imam Nawawi in one of his books. And the meaning of the hadith is that none of you truly believes until his desires, his desires are subservient to what I have brought. Meaning, our inclinations are now according to what Allah wants. Yes, we may not know, but the moment we find out what Allah subhanahu wa wants in any issue, now our desires should be inclined to what Allah subhanahu wa Maybe it will not, we will not like it in the beginning. But we will do it because Allah wants us. So this is how we mean by that. Now, for us to have ourselves to be confident and to have a nation of confident youth and the ummah, we have to make sure one, one more thing, and inshallah I'll stop there. Which is to have a clear vision in our minds. What exactly is the purpose of our life as individuals? And what is the purpose of this ummah? What is the mission that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed on us? If we don't have a clear mission, if we don't have a clear goal in front of us, how can we go in that direction? What is that goal Allah has set for each and every individual? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We have not created mankind and the jinn time, but to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the purpose of our life. It has to be clear to us. Yes, you can, we can generate, we can have youth, our children to be very confident, but they can be very confident doctors, engineers, accountants, on and on and on. But that's what they are. If they are not looking at the life from the perspective, from the lenses of Islam, then everything has to be focused according to that I am pleasing Allah or not. Yes, we should be best at whatever we do. I'm not trying to say don't be any of those things. But the main purpose of life has to be clear. And along with that, our mission has to be clear. What is the mission that Rasulullah says? Allah is saying, that he who has sent his messenger with the guidance, with the deen of truth. But what? This lamb in Arabic is called lamb ta'aleem. That's the purpose of sending Muhammad. What is the purpose? So this deen, this way of life that Muhammad was sent with, with this mission, this deen, this way of life prevails over all ways of life. Why? Is it because the Arab? Is it because the Daisy thing? Or is it because the African thing? Or is it because this or that? No. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is good for all the human beings. Because if we are not following the path of Allah, then the path is the path of deviation. The only right path is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that can only happen when we have this attitude. That what Allah has given us, that covers everything. That covers everything. It gives me the answer for everything. We should not be the ones who think of the life as, yes, when I am inside the masjid, yes, yes I am, when I'm inside my own house, 
Yes, when I'm inside a place where all the Muslims are there, we talk about Islam. When we're out of these, then I have another life. Muslims are not supposed to be this way. There's no secularism in Islam. Islam gives us a way of life. It gives us all sorts of systems to live by. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, نَزَلْنَ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبِيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَرَحْمَةً وَبُشْرًا لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ that we have revealed to you this book that explains the kulli shay, everything. That book tells us that the Quran tells us to follow Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as well. And anything other than Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam brought, it will be rejected. Anything that we think that Allah subhanahu wa taala will accept it from our own expectation of our mind, it's not going to be accepted. Because of what Aisha radiallahu an reported and her reported, وَمَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْ فَهُوَ رَدْهُ If you come up with something which is not from us, it will be rejected. Now, to end the talk, to conclude about building, cultivating the, the confident Muslim, these three things to remember. Very simple faith in the child. When we are trying to build a staff, of confident Muslim personality. Remember that to build an unshakable aqidah on solid foundation, which is based on rationale actually. So we, build, we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By reasoning, we believe in Allah. We believe Muhammad is the Muslim of Allah and the Quran the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This has to be built first to the point that there is no shakiness in there. And then the aqidah should produce the actions according to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A Muslim who is confident to live according to Islam as a whole and calling others for Islam as well. This is what a confident Muslim would be doing. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Podcasts on current events, Islamic guidance, Quran tafsir, and sirah are available at islampodcasts.com as well as on iTunes. Rate, review, and comment, and let us know how we can grow in our knowledge to better serve our community. Please subscribe, share, and tell a friend about IslamPodcasts.com. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Podcasts on current events, Islamic guidance, Quran tafsir, and sirah are available at IslamPodcasts.com, as well as on iTunes. Rate, review, and comment, and let us know how we can grow in our knowledge to better serve our community. Please subscribe, share, and tell a friend about IslamPodcasts.com.